one person's opinion could have ended my whole career. So these uh, supplemental question banks were very instrumental in me passing my end of rotation exams and ultimately the pants. Learn every little tiny bit of information and practical experience that you possibly can because those are the rotations, the rare rotations, where 100% of your confidence as a new provider comes from. Basically, your test taking strategy is going to be read the last couple of sentences first, then read the question uh, choices, and then if you still need to, go back and skim the rest of the question. Hey guys, my name is Boris, I'm a physician assistant, and the topic of today's video is going to be how to survive in clinical year of PA school, and this advice just might save your ass. So the inspiration for this video came from this question in the physician assistant, physician associate, student and new grad group on Facebook. You know, pre-PA students, current PA students ask questions, and then, you know, current PA students and practicing PAs such as myself, uh, you know, when we see a question that we think that we have some good advice on, we answer the question and hopefully that uh, response helps some people and helps them get through school, right? So uh, definitely something I utilized while I was a PA student. And so I'm just going to answer this question right here. Uh, it just says, hello, I just finished the didactic phase of PA school and I will be transitioning to clinicals soon. If you do not know, most people here probably do, but if you do not know, PA school has two phases. There's the didactic portion where you learn all your book learning. Basically, it's a year to 18 months or so, depending on the program, and you do all of your classes. So you do clinical medicine, you do pharmacology, you do anatomy, physiology. Uh, you might have some humanities courses thrown in there, depending on the program, but that's the basis of what you do. You just get all of your didactic, which means you know from the books, uh, all your theory, kind of all that kind of stuff in place. And then uh, once you do that, then if you pass all of that, you take your end of, uh, you take your final exams, you pass the didactic portion, then you're on to the clinical portion, which is usually about a year. Some programs, it might be a little bit longer. For most programs, it's one year, 12 months, uh, usually eight to 10 rotations, depending on how long they are uh, in all the basic areas of medicine, plus maybe some elective, depending on what your interests might be. But all of them, you can find them online, but it's primary care, internal medicine, uh, women's health, psychiatry, so, you know, mental health, uh, emergency medicine. I'm going to draw a blank on a bunch of the other ones, but there's like some core rotations, which are, I think, eight of them. And then, you know, depending on the program, you'll get some electives. So this person in particular just passed their didactic portion. So congratulations. That's awesome. That is definitely very difficult to do. And then they're on to their clinical portion. Of course, they say they're nervous. And, you know, they just want some advice how to prepare what they can do to survive the uh, clinical year portion of PA school. Some people say clinical year is easier. Some people say it's harder, just depending on you and also your situation. Uh, so when I saw this question pop up, I was actually at work and we had a snowstorm. So a few people didn't show up. I had a little bit of downtime. And so I actually took some time to think about it and write out a well thought out response, which you see here on the screen uh, in front of you. And I'm just going to read that to you and just kind of riff on it. This isn't in no way, uh, in no way is this comprehensive. You know, there's definitely other advice I would have on clinical year. There's a lot of other good things that people said below uh, about clinical year and what they would recommend. But this is just kind of what came to mind based on my experiences during clinical year, some of which are extremely positive uh, and I learned a ton, uh, some of which were kind of negative, And I also learned a ton about medicine, but also just about human nature and about, you know, what some people will and will not do and uh, how easy it is to possibly put your entire career at jeopardy based on one or two people's opinion. Yeah. Uh, so if that doesn't sh send shivers down your spine and make you terrified, it should. And uh, you should definitely watch the rest of this video because this advice and my situation and what happened to me might just save your butt, okay? So without further ado, here was my response to this person who basically just wanted some general advice on surviving clinical year of physician assistant school. I also think this would be applicable to nursing school, you know, medical school, uh, any sort of medical training where you have a clerkship sort of a deal where you're in person with a preceptor or multiple preceptors. So. Uh, I'm just going to read my response word for word and also just riff on it and see if there's anything else that comes to mind, okay? Okay, let's do it. So I said, my first patient no-showed because of the snowstorm, so I have some time to drop some nuggets of wisdom, lol. Uh, and basically I just said how to survive clinical year. Number one, accept that your preceptors are human. 
They are not perfect. They're stressed. They may or may not have time to teach you anything or even pay attention to you. Some just might not like you. It happens. All right. So me, like probably anybody else going into clinical year, I thought that it was going to be this like very hands-on uh, learning environment where your preceptor just rolls out the red carpet and they can't wait to teach you. And, you know, you get all this wonderful hands-on experience, all this stuff that you've been learning. In theory, you finally get to, you know, be hands-on with patients, actually do the exams, actually do your, you know, history taking practice, uh, learn all these different disciplines from these extremely experienced preceptors who are fantastic providers, and they just can't wait to, you know, put an effort in teaching you and making you as good of a provider, a future provider as possible. You know, that's what you expect. When you get there, sometimes you get that, and sometimes you get preceptors that even exceed those amazing expectations, and sometimes you don't. Okay, sometimes your preceptor might be busy. Sometimes they might have things going on in their personal life, um, outside of work that are distracting them. Sometimes it's just a freaking personality conflict and they just straight up don't like you. And that makes it so that they can't really teach you as well as maybe they could or should. Uh, either way, just this first piece of advice is just to kind of, uh, kind of just curb your expectations a little bit uh, and just understand that your preceptors are human even if, you know, for some students, they might be fantastic preceptors for you, they might not be and vice versa, you know, you might really gel really jive with certain preceptors and you learn a ton from them. And some people go like, you know, I really did not have a great experience with that person. So it's just not everything is perfect. Not everything is black and white. Not every situation or preceptor is the same to every student. And just understand that they're human, they might be trying their best, they might not be trying their best. Uh, you know, situations may or may not come up where the experience, the learning experience might be great for you. It might not, you know, so basically just understand that your preceptor is human and give them that grace and just do what you can to get as much out of the rotation as possible, whether or not they're a great preceptor, you know, uh, or they're a great preceptor at the time. So just understand they're human. They may or may not be perfect. And it's up to you to just make it the best that it possibly can be for you, you know, because it's your career. It's not theirs. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, when you do get a rotation that is really, really good and a good learning environment, and in my experience and that of people I've talked to, you might get, you know, two or three of these if you're lucky. You might only get one. You might not get any rotations where you really learn anything. You know, like I said, don't be idealistic. It's not perfect. Uh, but if you do, if you do get a rotation where you and your preceptor get along, they actually do have time and effort and they actually do take your education seriously and they do really want to train you, you know, more often than not, take full advantage because you may or may not get another preceptor or rotation like this again. And these are the rotations where all of your confidence as a new provider comes from, you know. Again, ideally, all eight to 10 of your rotations, you're going to be hands-on, you're going to be taking care of patients, you're going to be getting frequent feedback from your preceptors, they're going to be open to teaching you, they're going to be, you know, um, energetic and motivated and wanting to teach you, ideally. But in, real in reality, sorry, in reality, uh, from my experience and from those of dozens of other PA students that I've talked to, it's just not the case most of the time. So you get one, two, maybe three of these amazing um rotations, regardless of the specialty, even if you don't want to work in that specialty, just where all the stars line up, you get along with the preceptor, they have the time and the energy and the desire and motivation to teach you and all those things line up and it is an actual good learning environment for you practically hands-on, learn every little tiny bit of information and practical experience that you possibly can because those are the rotations, the rare rotations where 100% of your confidence as a new provider comes from. So go in early, stay late, ask every possible question without annoying your preceptor too much. You know, um, don't, you know, leave a bad taste in their mouth. Don't exhaust them, but do as much as you can and take full advantage of the learning opportunity because you may not get another one. And again, for the third time, this is where 100% of your confidence as a new provider will come from, is from these awesome learning experiences, these awesome rotations with these awesome preceptors. So please, please, please take full advantage and learn as much as you can when you do finally get a good one. And this might be your first one, you know, right out of the gate. You might realize, wow, everything is going as it should. Yeah, like put in as much possible effort as you can, learn as much as you can from that one, uh, because it may or may not happen again, okay? Uh, yeah. Advice number three, buy the Roche Review Supplemental Question Bank for every rotation that it's available for. Um, this is a life hack that's well worth the money. I think they're like 100 bucks for like an extra 100, 120 questions. 
Um, and I personally, I mean, I'm not sponsored by freaking Rosh Review. Take this at your own uh, risk, whether or not you get anything out of Rosh Review or not. But me personally, my first, I think two or three um, end of rotation exams, they were kind of, I passed everything on the first try. I didn't have to remediate anything. But those first two or three, I think they were kind of like average, like 50th percentile or lower. And I think one, I even really struggled to pass. I was like barely, barely passing. I passed by just a few points. And then when I started getting these supplemental Rosh Review uh, question banks, which are available for all the core rotations, not all of your uh, elective rotations, but definitely all your core rotations. Um, when I started buying them, I just noticed that my scores were at least 50th percentile, if not better, and usually better. And actually better and better as uh, everything went along. And then, of course, I passed the exam at the end of the year. I forget what it's called. I passed the pants. So these uh, supplemental question banks were very instrumental in me passing my end of rotation exams and ultimately the pants, you know, um, and of course, ultimately getting certified by the NCCPA as a physician assistant, right? PAC, not just PA, but PAC, which is what you need to practice. Uh, so uh, my third piece of advice for clinical here is to get these Rosh Review supplemental question banks, because for me personally, they helped tremendously and they were really, really worth the money. Okay, piece of advice number four, find ways, now be careful with this one. Piece of advice number four is find ways to study these question banks every spare minute you get. So you're at home, you're in the bathroom, on the toilet, just get it on your phone and do some questions. You're waiting for your meal at the restaurant, do some questions. You're, I don't know, sitting in traffic or you're somebody else is driving, I hope, do some questions. You're just sitting around at home, do some questions. Anytime you have a spare moment, take out your phone and do even one question. And you know, look at the explanation if you got it wrong. Just find ways to incorporate this into your life. But with a giant caveat, do not let your preceptor see you studying unless you're 100% sure that they're cool with it. Ask me if I know. How do I know? Because I think this has burned me a couple of times. Now, nobody told me, hey, you shouldn't be studying on this rotation. You should be doing X, Y, and Z. No, sometimes they'll just get like a sideways glance and you can tell that they're not, you know, they don't like it and then you stop, you know. Uh, maybe even ask them, you know, if there's downtime and I'm not seeing a patient and you're busy, is it okay with you that I study? And ask them like, honestly, make sure that there's no ounce of your preceptor being offended by you studying during your rotation time, okay? Because that can really burn you and later uh, in this video, you'll see exactly how and why. But if your preceptor is cool with it, they promise you that they're cool with it, they're not offended by you studying during the rotation, you know, if you have a spare minute, do a couple of questions. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what you want to do is to do these questions over and over and over and over and over again. One, solidifying the information in your mind. And two, even more importantly, practicing your test taking strategy, which I've talked about numerous times on this channel. But basically, your test taking strategy is going to be read the first couple of set or sorry, read the last couple of sentences first, then read the question uh, choices. And then if you still need to go back and skim the rest of the question. But usually just those last two sentences and the question choices will give you everything you need to answer the question and move on because speed is of the essence. You only have 60 seconds on average on the pants and on your end of rotation exams per question. And sometimes they're very long questions, you know? So this advice definitely uh, saved me and got me way better at test taking. So anyway, a little bonus tip, how to, test, uh, how to test take in PA school, especially during clinical year when you only have that one minute per question. Uh, but I made a whole video about this. I'll link it above, you know, check that out. Anyway, so piece of advice number four is study these question banks and just the general Rosh Review question banks and, you know, whatever uh, pants prep question banks you have. Uh, just study those every spare minute of your life during clinical year because you will need that repetition. All right, piece of advice number five for surviving uh, clinical year is ask for feedback frequently and very humbly. Okay, this is a weird one I said because I found that some pre uh, preceptors kind of get offended when you seem confident about anything. You know, like basically there's this whole like medicine or uh, confidence is earned in medicine mentality that some people have, which I agree with. I mean, the last thing you want is to be a provider that's reckless. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know when to ask for help. And of course, that is could be deadly, you know, in medicine. So humility is definitely extremely important. I just personally think that it goes in two different directions. Like you, you could be very confident even as a new provider that you know what you know, but you also know where the line is. You know what you don't know and you are more than happy to ask for help and you should uh, if you don't know something. But some preceptors just do get kind of scared and kind of skeezed out by a student 
or even like a new provider who's confident about anything and speaks confidently about anything. So yeah, this definitely with some people, um, definitely got me, I wouldn't say necessarily in trouble, but definitely some preceptors I could tell did not appreciate it. Uh, and they even told me so. Um, basically, because I mean, I had been trained to at least appear confident from years and years ago in the military, for instance, like I was in the ceremonial guard, where literally your whole job is to sit there and look pretty and look confident and make the United States government and the US Navy look good. So like, I just have that training, you know, my shoulders are back. Uh, my voice is usually pretty confident. My eye contact is just like, my whole air is just like being trained since my time in the military to make people think, all right, I got this. I know what I'm doing. You can count on me, right? So I just have that air. It's not something that I'm going to train myself to get out of. Uh, and if it offends people, you know, sorry, that's their effing problem that you don't like the fact that I'm confident. I understand why uh, a preceptor might not be comfortable with a student that seems so confident when they don't really know anything, you know, <laughs> in uh, practical knowledge as a provider. I totally understand that. Uh, but that doesn't mean just because I come off as confident, that does not mean that uh, that I'm not going to stop when I don't know something and ask for help. Like, obviously, I have in my entire clinical practice so far of over a year at this point. Yeah, that's what I've done. Anytime I run into anything that's remotely, like I don't know 100%, I'm doing the right thing, I ask my supervising physician and he's happy to help, you know? So uh, this is kind of a weird piece of advice, but ask for feedback, be very humble about it. And if you are one of those people that seems, just has like an air of confidence about them, kind of maybe think about hedging that a little bit and just trying to be a little bit more humble uh, in, every way that you interact, especially with your preceptors. And then I also said, uh, um, yeah, I guess some preceptors, this might be an assumption, but might seem more comfortable if you as a student have this air of like being nervous and terrified 24 seven and never seem confident because you know, they think that you shouldn't be as a student. I don't know. It's just take this for what it is. Take this with a grain of salt. But that was my experience that my confidence actually got me in trouble with some people. Some people didn't like it. So I don't know. Take that for what you will. Maybe that will help somebody. Finally, number six. Do I have a number seven? No, I don't. Just number six. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the most important one um, in the video. Okay. And I even said number six piece of advice for surviving a uh, clinical year of PA school is, and this one will save your butt, if anything is wrong on the rotation, even a little tiny bit, anything at all, and even if this is your first rotation, I don't care, anything at all seems off. You're not getting opportunities to learn for whatever reason. Preceptors are not paying attention to you or as much attention as you think they should be. It seems like the preceptor doesn't like you. Do not just brush it off as in, oh, it's okay, it'll all be okay. Um, there's any tension or drama or negativity whatsoever. You get any sort of a bad vibe in your stomach, even if you're wrong. Even if you think you might be wrong, even if you're almost sure that you're wrong, if you get any, any bad vibe whatsoever for any reason, you just get that pit in your stomach like something is wrong here or might be wrong here, please, please, please bring it up to your clinical coordinator and any leadership in your PA program, whoever that may be, you know, the, the dean of the program, the uh, whatever, your clinical coordinator, whoever you're supposed to bring things up to that might be wrong on rotations, please bring it up. Don't get dramatic and say, oh, this person didn't pay attention to me as much as I think they should, uh, they should be, so I'm just, I need another rotation, you need to take me out of this. Like, no, absolutely not. Don't tell them what they need to do. Don't be dramatic about it. Don't be, whatever. Uh, but definitely, if you feel like anything is off at all, bring it up. Say, hey, look, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just a student. This is one of my first rotations. I don't know what is right and wrong, but you know, this is how I feel. You know, is this justified? Just letting you know, what is your advice when you're talking to the clinical coordinator? You know, if anything feels off, bring it up to them. Tell them how you feel. Here's why. Here's exactly why. Because, so for me, I try to not be dramatic at the workplace. If something feels off, I just have an attitude of, okay, whatever, it's temporary, let's just deal with it. Uh, for whatever reason, this person is not paying attention to me. Maybe they're not being very nice. Maybe they're not being very friendly. Uh, you know, like whatever, this preceptor. My attitude is, I don't wanna rock the boat. Like this is a rotation. 
that the school needs. This is a rotation that I need. The preceptor is obviously getting something out of this whole deal. Let's just not rock the boat. Let's just do my best to not be dramatic. I'll get what I can out of the rotation, even if it's not much. You know, let's just do it and just get through it. Like, whatever. Who cares? Uh, that was my attitude. And on two separate occasions, it actually almost screwed me. On one separate occasion, it kind of screwed me. On one other separate occasion, it really almost screwed me, as in almost totally destroyed my career before it even began. So listen up. This is one that you absolutely need to pay attention to because it might save your butt. If something feels off, even a little tiny bit, you get any sort of a bad vibe from the rotation or from the preceptor, bring it up immediately. Bring it up immediately. And here's why. On one of my last rotations, and this is a true story, and I'm reading word for word uh, from what I told this person. So on one of my last rotations, uh, it was kind of like this. Uh, the rotation was in a small town, and there was actually already another PA student there for a few weeks when I had started. So I was brand new. It was my first day. This student had been there for like three, four, or five weeks, right? Uh, the student was local. So, uh, she was from this small town. She already knew everybody. I think she was actually a patient at the practice uh, at one point. So like everybody there knew her, loved her, you know, grew up with her for years, right? Um, she's also a brilliant, super nice, super friendly, super smart, super organized, just a fantastic PA student. So nothing against her. Like she was fantastic, right? Uh, but long story short, it was kind of hard for me to figure out my place on that rotation. And the preceptors honestly weren't really friendly or approachable or open to teaching me. Like sometimes they would say, oh, I've already, you know, precepted for this other student once this week or twice this week. Like I'm not, I don't want to do it again with you, uh, basically. Some just barely even said one word and they were just like, yeah, whatever. Or like, hey, can I follow you today? Doctor, whatever, PA, whatever. And like, they would kind of turn away, like super standoffish. Like just not, like I could just tell they didn't want me there. Maybe they were already exhausted from having another PA student and like, here comes another one. I don't want to teach them whatever. I don't know, but like the vibe was just off, right? So this person, this other student had already like felt really at home. She like, had her go-to procedures, whatever, people were expecting her, like on Tuesdays she was with this person, on Wednesdays she was with this person, like the rotation was set up very well for her. When I came in, it just seemed like they were just, they did not want me there, you know, in, uh, in not so many words. Uh, the practice manager was super friendly, super nice. The primary preceptor, at least at first, seemed super friendly and super nice, um, and all the other ones were just kind of eh, neutral to not so much. Uh, like I said, just after being on so, uh, a few rotations, this being one of my last ones, I felt that I was not really wanted. There was not like a clear uh, path, you know, forged for me. Like it was basically make it whatever you can, get your hours and whatever. But like, I just, I could tell that it just wasn't very well organized. The communication wasn't there. They, most of them didn't seem to want me there. It just was what it was, right? And so like I just told you a second ago, I was just gonna, you know, just put my head down, get through it, do what I can, learn what I can, and just get out of there. Uh, but as you'll see in just a moment, that was a massive mistake. I should have said something. I should have said something the first day or the first week at least. Uh, but anyway, so what I just said was um, I had difficulty figuring out my place on the rotation. The communication really wasn't good there. Most of the preceptors weren't very friendly or open to teaching me exactly like I just told you. Uh, I asked the primary preceptor when, uh, when this person was at work, uh, you know, they rotated in shifts, so they weren't always there when I was there. But I asked them for feedback every single time that we worked together, daily, every time I was there with them on the same shift. My mid-rotation evaluation uh, was good, so you get a evaluation kind of like to warn you about anything that you might not be doing well, things that could be improved, uh, and just in general to like see where you are, basically, so you're not surprised at the end. Uh, my mid-rotation evaluation was good. Everything was satisfactory or better, except for one thing that was just below satisfactory that we had already talked about. Uh, and, you know, I worked to improve that, right? And so my mid one was totally fine. I was getting decent feedback from everyone uh, that I worked with. Like, there didn't seem to be any problem, at least officially, right? Like, I still didn't feel like I was really welcome. I kind of felt out of place, but whatever. Like, on paper, everything seemed fine. So I was just like, all right, a few more weeks. Let's just get through this. Obviously, these people don't want me here, but whatever. Let's just not rock the boat, not mess up the rotation for me, for them, or for my school, and just get through it. And again, like I told you a second ago, that was a huge mistake. So, like I just said, my mid-rotation evalu uh, mid evaluation was good. Then, one week after the rotation is over, 
one week after the rotation is over, I'm waiting for my final evaluation to say, you know, you passed the rotation, here's your feedback, blah, 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 like every single other one I had passed. I had never had an issue passing a rotation. Uh, so a week after this rotation is over, I find out that the primary preceptor actually failed me and gave me one out of five in like every category just about and said in their comments that I have an overall lack of understanding of medicine, which is like the worst feedback you could possibly give a uh, clinical year PA students towards the end of their clinical year. Like, yeah, this person overall just doesn't know anything. I don't think they should be a provider. And, you know, when my mid-rotation evaluation, everything was satisfactory or better except for one thing, now everything is like way below satisfactory, one out of fives, you know, going from three out of fives or four out of fives or five out of fives to one out of five for like everything and with this kind of like crippling feedback. And this was actually one of my last rotations. And by the way, I aced the end of rotation exam. That was my best one yet. It was like way above average, way above 50th percentile. So obviously I knew the material. I knew what I was doing at least to some degree or I wouldn't have passed the freaking end of rotation exam. And this person still gave me, you know, all this feedback, uh, basically made me fail the rotation, right? One out of five on almost everything, which is terrible. Um, and what ended up happening was, was I had to do an extra rotation to make up for this one, uh, on which basically my future depended on. So if this extra rotation would have been bad and there would have been another preceptor that like, for whatever reason, had a negative opinion of me, that would have been it. I would have been out with no makeup. Like that would have been it. 10 plus years trying to get into PA school, all that time, money, effort, and my life, uh, dedicated to becoming a PA and getting into this career, finally getting into the school and being on my last couple of months of the training, it could have all been taken away just like that because of one person's opinion. One person's opinion, right? Not even objective fact, like the end of rotation. That's objective. You pass it or you don't. And I pass it with flying colors. One person's opinion could have ended my whole career, okay? Now, if that doesn't send shivers down your freaking spine, nothing should. And, you know, that'll go into the later part of this uh, message that I'm writing here. But just to put that into perspective, all that time, all that effort, all that money, getting into school, getting through school, training, blah, blah, blah. One person's opinion could have ended all of that. One person who, by the way, just weeks before that, gave me official feedback that was basically all good. Like you're on track to pass the rotation, you're fine. And then just changing their mind at the last minute. Yeah, that happened. Okay, so I almost would not have been sitting here. I almost would not have that stuff on the wall. I almost would not have been a PA uh, because of this one person's opinion. An opinion that they, by the way, did not even communicate to me or the program or anyone until the rotation was over. So this goes back to if anything feels off, even a little tiny bit, even a little tiny bit, bring it up to your program leadership freaking immediately. So they can maybe get you on a different rotation. They can intermediate. Uh, they can whatever they're going to do, but let them know that something feels off because if you ignore it and if your preceptor happens to be vindictive, if they just have a negative opinion of you, if they're for whatever reason, they would do something like this to you. Uh, at the very least, it's on your leadership's radar that something has been off since the beginning. You try to address it and you know, nothing came of it, but take your career into your own hands. Because like I said, one person's opinion can end it if you are not careful, okay? So just finishing up my message here. Uh, yeah, so basically what I had to do was this one extra rotation upon which my entire future basically depended on. And thank God the preceptor at this makeup rotation was a great guy, he was honest, he communicated well, he actually gave a crap, he taught me, he took time out of his day, even though he was extremely busy, to teach me things, to show me things, to quiz me, to test me, to have me see patients, you know, on my own and with him together. Like this was an actually good preceptor. Also, this preceptor was very impressed and a bunch of times actually tried to get me to work there at the current clinic that, you know, I was rotating with and in general in the hospital system uh, down in that one town that I went to. Like he kept saying, hey, by the way, if you need a job, you know, I could get you basically any job in this hospital system. Just say the word. And I was just like, oh, you know, thank you very much. But I already had something lined up at that time that I, you know, I wasn't going to work there. But that just goes to show that I did know what the crap I was doing. I did have a decent understanding of medicine. This person was very impressed. Um, you know, kept trying to offer me jobs. Obviously, if you're 
you have no understanding of medicine, you're not going to be offered jobs. And I got, not to mention this job offer, plus the one I already had accepted and wanted, you know, after I was done with school, plus two other ones. Okay, so four out of my rotations straight up offered me jobs on the spot. So anyway, I said, sorry for the very long story. The point is, if you feel a bad vibe, even a little bit, tell your program leadership immediately, ASAP. Do not wait. Do not think it'll just be okay. It probably will be, but it may not be. And if you want an example of how it may not be, listen to the story that I just told you. Um, and I said, I guess one bonus lesson here is that if your preceptor has come, oh, and I said, uh, I guess one bonus lesson here, one bonus piece of advice is that your preceptor has complete power over you and your future. And in parentheses, I said, which is completely insane given what happened in my situation. So keep that in mind and act accordingly. All right. I don't know how long this video is because I probably rambled and backtracked here and there, but I just want to communicate very, very clearly that in clinical year, the number one tip I have for surviving clinical year is that your preceptor has 100% total power over you and of your future. Okay. So act accordingly. And if you feel a bad vibe at all, even a little tiny bit, immediately bring it up to your program leadership because that may save your career. All right, guys, hopefully you got something out of this video. Uh, those are my tips for surviving clinical year. Like I said, of course, there's many others. There's uh, lots of other stuff I could have told you, but this was the biggest thing and especially wanted to share the story of what happened to me in hopes that it could prevent something like this from happening to you. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next video. Let me know if you have questions and uh, have a great day.